Hello, everybody. I'm Tali Berman, Director of Operations here at SciTech, and I am very excited to welcome you to the next session of our SciTech Virtual Summit, Day 2. And I am honored to introduce our next presenter, Dr. Mark Bronstein. Dr. Mark Bronstein, who we are very fortunate to have on our Medical Advisory Board, after graduating from medical schools in 1997, medical school in 1997, Dr. Mark completed his residency in general psychiatry and his fellowship in child and adolescent psychiatry. Shortly thereafter, he began utilizing medical cannabis in Durango, Colorado for the treatment of various psychiatric conditions. With 22 years of clinical experience and over 100,000 office visits, Dr. Mark pioneered cannabis dosing protocols. Through his company, Reconscious Medical Group, he continues forging new paths in plant-based medicine, which combines affordable psychedelic psychotherapy models and traditional mental health platforms. Dr. Mark, we are really honored to have you here. Uh, thank you so much for taking your time and sharing your wisdom with us. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm really excited to be here today and talking about ketamine. Um, I'm Dr. Mark Bronstein. I've always been known as Dr. B. However, more recently, I had a patient call me Dr. Mark with a K um, since I've been working with ketamine, and I just love that name. I practice medicine, and I'm the medical director for three different plant medicine-based clinics in New Mexico and Colorado. And I've also been consulting in the addiction and rehabilitation spaces for many years. And one of my passions as a former psychopharmacologist is to help people transition from traditional psychiatric medications to plant-based medications. So I'd like to talk to you guys today about ketamine. This is kind of an introductory talk about ketamine. Uh, those of you who already know tons about this medication, uh, this might be a little rudimentary and I apologize ahead of time. Uh, however, for those of you who don't know a lot about ketamine, I think this will form a, a nice introduction. Ketamine uh, was first synthesized in the early 60s. And it actually came out of uh, phenylcycladine, which is PCP or angel dust, a very heavy animal tranquilizer that was never found to have any human uh, reasons for use except for being a drug of abuse. Uh, kind of a really scary drug of abuse, and that's what ketamine came out of. And ketamine first was patented as a veterinary anesthetic. Really rapidly, uh, about a year after it came out as a veterinary anesthetic, we decided to try it on prisoners uh, in a study. And we did a trial of about 100 different prisoners and found it was effective as an anesthetic. Um, the, the term dissociative anesthetic was coined during that time because patients described this feeling like they were floating in outer space and had no feelings in their limbs. Um, this is created by the electrophysiological and functional dissociation between the thalamocortical and limbic systems. What's really interesting is that um, a lot of these patients describe this as an adverse effect, uh, this dissociative experience. And that's because they weren't warned about this side effect. Uh, proper set and setting wasn't correctly used for these prisoners in 1964, I'm imagining. And we'll get more then to the need for proper set and setting and preparation for using this medication later. Um, not long after that, it was patented by Park Davis for human and animal use. And uh, the FDA approved it in 1970. It got a lot of its early use out on the battlefield during Vietnam War. It was thought that it was a very safe medication. It was called the buddy medication because you could have one soldier on the field give it to another wounded soldier without having to worry about uh, severe cardiovascular collapse or respiratory uh, collapse and crashing of the patient. Uh, so it has a long history of, of physical safety. Not that it's without risk and, and can't be dangerous, but it's safe enough that even a psychiatrist now are comfortable using this anesthetic medication in an outpatient basis. Uh, it was many years after it, it was it came out, uh, over 20 years later, that we actually discovered the NMDA receptor antagonist property of ketamine. It, it's that property that allows a dissociative nature and this psychotomimetic effects. Psychotomimetic is a very medical term for hallucinogenic effects. 
because really psychosis and, and hallucinations can be thought to be pretty similar. Uh, whereas in this context, the hallucinations or envisions are going to be positive. Um, the medication continued to be used as an anesthetic during that time. And it was around 2000 when NIMH approved a IV model using a half milligram per kilogram dripped in over 40 minutes. In 2000, the first study came out showing it was effective for depression. Similar studies in 02 and 06 showed the efficacy of this low dose IV model of ketamine for depression. Around 2010, the first IV ketamine clinics started opening up uh, for pain and depression. And then over the last 10 years, um, more so in the last several, we've seen this rapid increase in, in opening up of IV ketamine clinics all over America. I'm not so familiar with what's going on with them in the rest of the world. I think right now it's hot and it's starting to grow. But really from 20 to 10 to 2020 is where we've, we've seen the most growth in using the ketamine in the IV model for depression and now other psychiatric conditions. In 2019, esketamine was approved for the treatment of depression as well. Esketamine is an isomer of, uh, and a metabolite of ketamine. Let's look a little bit about how ketamine works. Ketamine is an NMDA receptor antagonist, which creates increased levels of glutamate and glycine. Again, this is what creates the dissociation and the visions, is that NMDA receptor antagonism effect increasing levels of glutamate and glycine. However, ketamine does a lot of other different things. It's kind of a dirty drug acting on different neurotransmitters, which is why at different doses it has different effects, which is why it's a drug of abuse at low doses and more of a therapeutic drug at high doses. It hits on serotonin, norepinephrine, acetylcholine, nicotine, GABA, dopamine, all these different neurotransmitters creating different effects. At low doses, uh, when you affect the dopamine receptor, the, the mu opiate receptor, people feel a euphorogenic stimul stimulant effect. Um, and that's, I, I think, what creates the drive for people to abuse this drug recreationally. It, the, the low dose intoxicant stimulating euphorogenic effects. As we get to a higher dose, that's where that NMDA receptor antagonism kicks in. That's where you start to have visions, you start to have dissociation. That's when the default mode network gets shut down. When that default mode network gets closed down and we have new neuronal pathways and dendritic sprouting between the limbic and thalamocortical systems, that's what creates new patterns of beliefs and new ways of feeling. So it's that higher dose of ketamine given affecting on the NMDA receptor antagonism that really creates profound mood changes. And, and those higher doses, that's what in recreational terms people refer to as the K-hole. And they don't want to go there. Uh, in a recreational sense, turning off your default mode network can be really intense and scary. But in a therapeutic sense, I think that's where all the, the beauty happens. Ketamine's not without risks. It definitely has dangers of abuse and dependence. Hallucinating can be really scary for people if they're not ready for it. Again, that K-hole. It can be a really frightening place, which is why in a medical setting, we spend so much attention to preparation, evaluation for safety, and set and setting. So someone knows what they're going into. When they start hallucinating, they're not freaking out that they're going crazy. They know it's happening and it's part of the process. And they believe that's where the healing is going to come out of. Very different than having a, a scary hallucinatory experience out on the dance floor at a, or at a festival where you can't walk, you can't talk, and you're hallucinating. That, that's a definite danger of, of abuse of this medication is taking it in an unsafe uh, context. If also, if, if you're not properly screened for this medication, let's say you have a, a tendency towards psychosis or towards mania and, and you use this re medication recreationally without oversight, it can send someone into a persistent psychotic 
episode. I've seen this. I've seen it work and go on for months at a time where someone is kind of unhinged. So really proper attention has to be given to screening. Overuse is a concern with these medications. Because of that increased neuronal activity and excitotoxic, excitative activity in the brain, it's positive when used cautiously and discriminatively. But if you use it constantly, the excitotoxicity can cause neuronal damage possibly with prolonged use, or again, creating a persistent manic or psychotic state. Also, if you're going to be using these medications chronically in the long term, you have a constant kind of numbing down on the psyche repeating what psychiatry has been doing with Prozac, Zoloft, Depakote, Lithium, Zyprexa, curing mental illness by numbing down our feelings. That's not how these medicines are meant to work. And theogenic medicines are made to give us more awareness of, of our psyche and our surroundings. So we don't want to create the same mistakes that psychiatry has been doing with the neurotransmitter model and the numbing for the last 35 years with these medications. Another major concern is when people use these medications recreationally, they mix it with things. They mix it with cocaine. They mix it with methamphetamine. They mix it with mushrooms, LSD, MDMA. While you can, in a clinical setting, mix some of these medications. For instance, uh, I know some of my colleagues have, have used MDMA and ketamine together. If done in the wrong person with the wrong blood pressure, it, it can give them a heart attack and kill them. So again, recreationally, a, a big risk is what are what chemicals people are putting together. And, and similar to that, besides causing increased blood pressure and heart problems, if you're going to utilize this, abuse this medication in conjunction with alcohol or benzodiazepines like Xanax, you can cause respiratory suppression and even death. Other dangers of this medication is more from a predatory standpoint. It's a dissociative anesthetic where someone can't talk or walk. It's been used as a date rape drug, unfortunately. Obviously, it's not safe to drive on ketamine. So people doing a, a little nasal ketamine and thinking they're okay and getting behind the wheel can be really dangerous. It's an intoxicant. And again, like, like a lot of the other entheogenic medications, the, one of the biggest dangers of this medication is legal ramifications of misuse. Although it is a Schedule Three medication that can be prescribed, it's illegal to have without that. And severe penalties can follow. Let's talk about why we use ketamine. What are the indications for use? I mean, the approved indications for use for ketamine and S-ketamine are treatment-resistant depression. That means where someone has tried and failed two good courses of traditional antidepressants and they haven't worked for them. That being said, in psychiatry, we love to use medications off label. Uh, just because a medication is approved for depression or for bipolar disorder, in psychiatry, we find our way to, to try the medication for all different diagnoses. And we're doing that again with ketamine. So whereas it's approved for depression, we're using it in OCD, bipolar depression, acute and chronic suicidality, personality disorders, end of life care, couple and family therapy. Uh, so a lot of different reasons why we're using ketamine, even autism, neurodegenerative disorders. And while it's, no, it's not a bad thing to, to be uh, exploring the possibility of using these medications uh, like ketamine for these different indications, we don't want to think about this as a silver bullet approach and a shotgun approach like psychiatry does with so many other neurotransmitters and medications. However, when integrated with therapy and using ketamine-assisted psychotherapy, then it makes a lot more sense to me why we can use it for these different conditions. Because it's not just the neurotransmitter approach in this shotgun approach that if we fix your, if we give you a blast of, uh, of glutamate, these conditions are going to get better. Instead, it's using that blast of glutamate to be able to see things in a different way, come up with new perceptions, realizations, and insights so that you can change your obsessive compulsive disorder behaviors, or you actually, your personality disorder may improve because the way that you've been seeing things forever can shift. But again, I think this is more when we utilize psychotherapy as well, and not just a biologic model of giving these medications. 
Uh, we can also use these medications for people who don't want to take long-term psychiatric drugs. So a lot of my patients, they don't want to take Prozac forever. Uh, it causes them sexual dysfunctions and where they might they might not be depressed, they feel numb and, and they, they're unable to, to have good sexual function. So someone like that or someone who's had weight gain for medications, let's just say they don't want to take a medicine every day even. This is a nice option, whereas maybe you can have your course of six ketamine treatments and, and possibly a tune-up every so often and, and transcend the need for daily medication. And finally, the other thing I want to mention is that you can use this medication in combinations with other things. You can use it, ketamine, in combination with other psychiatric medications or even in combination with shock therapy, ECT, or transcranial magnetic stimulation. But I think that's kind of the result of what shrinks do. We love to combine meds. Uh, modern psychiatry theory seems to be that more is better. If something helps a little, we'll add something else and it'll help more. And, and I hate to see the entheogenic medications used in this way. Instead, again, going back to therapy, I'm showing my bias here. If we can use therapy in conjunction with these medications, then maybe we don't just have to use them in combination with other meds, but have more of a transformative long-term approach. Let's talk about why you don't want to use these medications. We talked about why you would want to use them. If someone is pregnant and nursing, we don't want to use ketamine for obvious reasons. <clears throat> We've talked a lot about the risk of, of, of heart problems, right? So if someone has untreated hypertension or uncontrolled blood pressure, you don't want to give them a shot of ketamine. However, you can send them to an internist to get their blood pressure regulated, or I can give someone clonidine or propranolol before treatment, watch their blood pressure comes down and watch them during their session to make sure they are safe. So if someone has regulated high blood pressure, it's, it is okay to use ketamine most of the time. Um, however, that's again where that physician evaluation comes in because if someone's had multiple strokes and heart attacks and they have fragile high blood pressure, I'm probably not gonna wanna give it myself. Untreated hyper, hyperthyroidism can, is also a contraindication. Again, that's with, because usually with untreated hyperthyroidism, you're going to have increased catecholamines, blood pressure problems, whatnot. <clears throat> Again, liver, kidney, bladder disease, uh, pancreatic disease, we're going to want to be careful on, on using ketamine. You might want to have um, an assessment by their internist to okay them first for having this medication. But we also want to look at everything as a risks and benefits. Let's say someone does have some pancreatic disease that might be a contraindication normally, but let's say that they're acutely suicidal, they've tried every other medication, and this is, a, this is life or death. Then we might use the ketamine, even though there is a relative contraindication, because ketamine has saved people's lives. Multiple patients have told me, thank you, this has saved their life. We also want to worry about active psychosis and mania, a contraindication. Not to say if someone's ever been manic or psychotic, we can't use it. You want to look at the context. Did they have a unipolar depression with one episode of psychosis in the past? Or did they have a ketamine-induced psychotic disorder? Right? So it has to be assessed fully. Uh, we also want to be careful if they're on substances that can cancel the effects of ketamine. If they're taking alcohol, benzodiazepines, or other anticonvulsants that will cause you to have to give them more ketamine to get the effect. If you give too much of both, you can cause respiratory depression and that can be dangerous. Active substance abuse. That's really interesting. So if someone is actively abusing substances because they like to get high and they want to keep getting high and they want to come in and get ketamine and have a journey, I wouldn't give it to them. However, if someone is actively using substances and really wants to quit and has the intention of using ketamine to quit using substances, please bring them to treatment. Unrealistic treatment expectations. If someone is looking at this as a silver bullet, not looking at making any other changes in their lives, I would not want to give them ketamine. It's unrealistic that it's going to work. Also, if they've had a history of dissociative trauma, and this is a little controversial. If someone's had trauma while dissociated, yes, ketamine can be triggering. Just like if someone has, uh, if, if they've quit using needles for addictions, giving them a shot of ketamine can be triggering. However, it's also a opportunity to do therapy around these issues and have them transcend that. So 
a lot of these aren't so much total relative contraindications, but open for discussion, except for the uncontrolled high blood pressure or active psychosis or active mania, I would say. So there's going to be some differing strategies on how people utilize ketamine in a clinical setting. These strategies dif differentiate upon dosing, routes of dosing, frequency and total numbers of treatments, clinical settings, inclusion of psychotherapeutic models, and the type of clinician present. The most commonly used model around, around the globe is low-dose ketamine treatment, where we give a half a milligram per kilogram, it's IV, it's twice a week for three weeks, it's 40 minutes long, it's in a medical setting with medical monitoring, and the experience is mild intoxication, but not psychedelic. This is the biologic model, and it shows benefit. And this is what most people are utilizing. Then there's the mid-range psycholytic model. Uh, that model's between 0.25 and 0.75 milligrams per kilogram per day of bioavailable ketamine. The dosing route is going to be either intramuscular or sublingual, variable frequency, variable duration of treatment. It's going to be in a psychotherapeutic office or at home. The clinical oversight will be a therapist. This is really cool. It's not used much, but it's using low-dose ketamine, and people are talking. You can actually talk during therapy. Quite different than the macro-type dosing I'm talking about in ketamine-assisted psychotherapy, where we use a, a macro one to two milligram per kilogram of bioavailable medicine in an intramuscular or sublingual fashion. And this is to give someone a profound hallucinatory experience that we can combine with therapy and, and quite different than the other models I talked about. This is also like a three to four hour session. And the patient experience is going to include visions and full dissociation. And the setting is going to be, you know, at the patient's home or in an office. And if it's at home, it should be supervised by a medical professional. It's just, I found that sometimes home visits are nice for patients. Um, what better set and setting if they feel comfortable and safe in their home? I, I really do enjoy doing home visits for people with this medication. Uh, let's talk about a, a little bit. I think I've showed you my biases about therapy and why I prefer ketamine-assisted psychotherapy. Uh, using these higher doses, uh, creates that profound psychedelic experience. It can create transformative growth. I've, I've spent years with people, with them laying on my couch or sitting on my couch, talking, unwilling to look past their neuroses or, or defenses. I mean, probably over a decade without people changing. And then with, with one or, or two treatments of ketamine, it's like a throughway past their defenses. They're able to have new insights and perceptions and realizations that I didn't see in years, man. Um, that these people have been coming to therapy for years, spending lots of money, having the, the opinion that they were working hard on themselves, but never able to have that growth or that transformative experience. And then some treatments with ketamine and wow, man, all of a sudden, things really change, not just on a biologic level, but on a perceptual level, man. Things that people have seen the same way for years, decades, five decades, they're able to see in a, in a new light. Patterns of behavior, like addictions, long-standing patterns of addictions, people are able to change and drop like that. I can't tell you how many of my clients have, have come, and they weren't necessarily trying to quit. But as an aside of utilizing these medications, they've quit their Xanax or they've quit cigarettes or they've quit drinking or, or they're using much less cannabis or they're using their cannabis much more intentionally. Really, really interesting. And again, so ketamine assisted psychotherapy, I think, leads to transformative experiences that you don't see with the lower dose IV model. I think that lower dose IV model is great. It's a different model than what psychiatry typically has to answer, but it's not the end all to be all. And it's not going to create the permanent changes that will keep someone out of my office. So when I think about the IV ketamine model, I think it's, it's great and it's a great business model. People are going to keep coming back over time. They will have changed neurochemistry. They will get better, but it's not going to be permanent. So maybe ketamine-assisted psychotherapy isn't, isn't the greatest model for return customers. 
But in my opinion, if they're not coming back to see the psychiatrist because they're better, that's a success. And utilizing this therapy and utilizing integration and having conscious permanent change will keep them healthy and away from the psychiatrist. Let's look a little bit about what it's actually like to have a ketamine session. For those of you, you that, that don't know, in my opinion, this is kind of how it should work. The first thing you should do is be screened for eligibility. I think it's best done by a, a medical doctor and a psychiatrist who can make sure that medically you're going to be safe for this and psychiatrically you're going to be safe for this. And then someone who's trained in utilizing this medication so that they can look at your sensitivities and proclivities to certain psychoactive medications and come up with the best dose. Because just because we think one to two milligrams per kilogram IM is going to be the right dose for a psychedelic experience, there is a range. And you really do want to hit it right. You don't want to go too little, you don't want to go too much, but you want to go safely. So part of when you see that doctor and they come up with that initial plan of your initial dose, it should also come with a plan for a booster dose. Because you want to give someone, you want to give someone a little bit less than you think they're going to need that first time. And then about 10 minutes later, you can give them a little bit more to get them to the right place. And again, this is going to be like a long session. It's, it's going to be a four hour long session, three to four hour long before they, and you want them to be fasting before they come in and hopefully have done some prep work before they come in. So they know what they're getting into. They know what they're going to expect as far as laying down, having an eye shade on, having visions, seeing their shadows. We, we don't want any surprises when they come in. We want them to feel comfortable, secure, and that's when we talk about set and setting, making sure they feel good and secure and prepared for this journey. Because it's that fear of the unknown that this medication will feed on and increase. Whereas if you're calm, you're able to bring it in and accept and see. Uh, we want them to use the restroom before taking the medication. You don't want someone to have to go use the bathroom while they're on the medication. A, they're not gonna be able to walk that well. And B, it's going to be very distracting from the journey. When they're in this journey, we want to really minimize sensation as much as possible so that they can journey as far into their mind as possible. And so again, after we talk about the intention of why they're going into this journey, what they hope to get out of it, and then after they have the journey itself, which is going to last an hour, and they return, then the therapist or the doctor will download with them what they've experienced. And again, there's not going to be, usually they, they, won't have, they won't talk or move during the treatment. A few, a small percentage will cry or laugh, but most will, will be totally quiet and not moving during the treatment, but afterwards when they come back, you want to get from them what they saw, what they experienced, what they felt. And then you're going to put that into some kind of psychotherapeutic framework that they can integrate and work consciously on, on changing their thought patterns in the long run. Uh, the most common example I like to use, these medications often lead to visions or feelings of interconnectedness. And so people are to focus on that interconnectedness and the feelings that it brings them and engenders and, and, it, and how they will react to other people, how other people react to them and, and overall how they will feel and improve how they feel over time. And that's something that has to be practiced every day. If you just take a medicine and hope to feel better, that's just like taking Prozac and it isn't gonna work that great in the long term. But if you take this medication and consciously work out your brain like a muscle, then you're gonna have long-standing improvements. How long does it take to benefit? People are gonna feel better after their first dose of ketamine usually. Second dose, sixth dose, they're gonna feel better. They're gonna have an improvement, but that improvement will increase over time. So if you look at them a year out compared to a month out, if they've been doing their integration and working on themselves, they're gonna feel better a year out. So again, that improvement can be right away, but it can also keep occurring. And again, it's gonna be relative to, to the severity of the person's illness. Some people who are more severe or might need a, a booster treatment sooner rather than later. Other people might be able to wait six months or a year till another treatment. So again, it's gonna be a full range but these treatments do build upon each other. 
each journey leads into the next and you'll have increased personal growth with each one. Let's think about future considerations for ketamine. It would be great to see uh, more ketamine clinics open in proportion to IV clinics. Uh, it would be great to see more awareness of uh, the efficacy and need for ketamine assisted psychotherapy and not just reliance on the neurotransmitter model that has failed us for the last 35 years. Uh, it's also, we want to keep in mind when we're creating these ketamine assisted psychotherapy models that they can be applied to other entheogenic medica medications as they become legal. So we can plug MDMA or psilocybin or cannabis into these protocols. We also want to continue to investigate other related compounds. Uh, I know our ketamine is being looked at right now, and then just other ones. We can keep fine tuning and making this better. And we also need increased research on the therapy model. Please see the work of the Ketamine Research Foundation with Dr. Phil Wolfson. What a fan fantastic group. We also need to see increased research on certain conditions like suicidality, personality disorders, neurodegenerative disorders to show that ketamine can be effective and we're not just using this willy-nilly. And that being said, we really need to increase research on all these psychiatric conditions that ketamine is being touted for. So we don't go with the same psychiatric model of, of one size fits all that we're doing now. We must increase affordability and access to these medications. This should not be a treatment for the bougie and the 1%, but it's a global medicine for the people. And we Thank you. Must Sorry, I want to cut you off. This has been such a thorough and robust um, presentation, and you're ending with such an important piece, which is this is for the people. We want to make it accessible. We want to make it affordable. And I just want to say, just as we're wrapping up, I know you could probably talk for hours and hours, and we'd love to hear you for hours and hours. Well, unfortunately, we have to move on. Um, but I just want to say, Mark, just listening to you, what an honor and inspiration it is to hear someone like you share so much wisdom, so much experience, so much knowledge, and to share that all with so much passion. That's um, what's really so, so inspiring. That's the kind of doctor that should be treating people. That's the kind of uh, attitude that should be brought to, to psychedelics and the revolution they're all trying to create together. So thank you for your time. Thank you for the way that you've brought yourself and um, just wishing you so much success in your continued work. There was lots of questions, but you actually answered a good portion of them in your presentation, but you might get some more in the chat. So you can visit there too and answer some questions there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Holly. Blessings. Oh, thanks to you.